You ever have one of those really exciting things that you have to withhold from telling a friend until the right moment? That was it for us. Yeah. Uh, we've been excited. We've been thinking about this. And some, some of you know it because we've been talking about different ministries, but we really are excited about that, that Thursday service starting in the fall. Uh, like Joshua prayed, we've been in this series now. This is going to be our second week. And last week I was not here. Garrett introduced this spirit series to us with, with really the concept of the Trinity and how the Holy Spirit is in the Trinity. And as I was on the couch last week, I was going to go to a different church. We were down south and um, it was like 9.45 and I was like, oh, I'll, I'll check into the live stream and see where Garrett is in his sermon. I knew what he was preaching on. And so I was going to check in. I, I get caught up a little bit. And as I check into the live stream, Garrett's quoting Thomas Aquinas. And I'm like, mm, I'm good for now. I'll listen to it later. <laughs> but it was really important to get a foundation of the Spirit. And for some of us, when maybe this was true for you last week too, you're like, this just seems, it seems to be a lot. I'm not quite sure I'm there with everything that Garrett was covering. You don't work out at a gym week after week after month after month, lifting a one pound weight, right? You lift stuff that's a little bit too heavy for you to pick up. It, it's a strain at first. And this is how it could be intellectually too, Right? And maybe as we're going through the spirit stuff, it's a little bit too much. You're like, I'm, I'm not quite sure I'm grasping it. That can be good because it stretches us and it builds our spiritual muscles. And I encourage you, as, as I did, to listen to that sermon last week several times to really start diving into the understanding of the Trinity and the Spirit's relationship and the Father and the Son and how the Spirit is real. This was Garrett's topic last week. The Spirit's not just... Uh, a force out there. Spirit's not just some vague sense. Spirit is real and active. And this morning, we're going to talk about the ministry of the Spirit, renew. And we're not, I didn't call it jobs of the Spirit. Jobs sounded just cold and something the Spirit shows up to do. But the Spirit as a person of the Godhead is a personal divine inner Vening in your life. And so it's a ministry coming into your life to renew you. And something I couldn't get out of my head this week thinking about this message was CPR. I've only ever had to do CPR once. And if you've done CPR, you know, you remember that moment. And as I'm doing CPR, there's people around me gathering and they're helping me remember how to do CPR and and everything that's supposed to go, and you know, my pulse, I'm getting nervous. It's, it's this intense situation. And I'm like, it's just a rubber dummy that we're doing it on. Like, I didn't understand why <laughs> everybody's gathering around. Um, it was part of, sorry, maybe I should have started with that. <laughs> it was part of um, the security team here had a session to, 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 to learn CPR. For those that didn't know, it, it was my first time doing it. So you're learning the counting and all the things you need to do for it, just in case of an emergency, right? Just in case of the, the, the worst thing that could happen. And I was thinking about this, and I loved how Tom's community meditation uh, dovetails this message so clearly. The Christian perspective, the Christian understanding, is that you and I, at one point, were on the floor in need of CPR. And those that haven't turned to God yet are, are still on the floor of their life and need CPR so desperately. And the Spirit is the one that comes and renews. Let me read a definition of renew. There's several definitions out there. To make like, like new, restore to freshness, vigor, or perfection. Here's one that I think fits best for us this morning. To resume an activity after an interruption to resume an activity after an interruption. And the example that they gave in the di dictionary is that parents renewed their campaign to save the school. You, you renew something after it's been, been dead, after it's been forgotten about, it's renewed. It's made alive again. And so here's my example of that dictionary definition of renew and our main thought for today. The Holy Spirit is renewing humanity back to a relationship with God. The Bible is clear. You and I, all of us, all of humanity was on the ground 
dying because of the sins of their heart, because of their decisions they made. We were lost. We were dead. We, you, you can't do CPR to yourself. You understand that, right? You need someone else to come and resuscitate you or to renew you back to life. And so in our relationship with God, we were lost. And there's nothing we could do in and of ourselves to renew us, to make us alive again. We needed something outside of ourselves. There's a book I've been reading along with this series by Fred Sanders called The Deep Things of God. And it's a book about the Trinity and the spiritual relationship in the Trinity. And he says these words that I thought would help us understand the ministry of renewal. It says, Jesus saved me. The Father forgave me. But the Holy Spirit convicted me, brought me to my knees and showed me God. He showed me Jesus Christ and I was gripped by his strong, sweet love. And then he shoved me towards God and I gladly fell into the arms of my loving father. See, the ministry of renewal for the Holy Spirit is to bring CPR to the point that we can, we can recognize who God is. We can understand what Jesus has done for us. The ministry of the Holy Spirit, as Garrett, Garrett talked about last week, is to Make Jesus real. Just as the Holy Spirit is real, it's also to reveal Jesus being real. And we would never understand the death of Jesus if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit. We would never be made alive in our stone heart and the decisions we've made if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit. You might be thinking, well, I wasn't on death's door. I mean, I wasn't that bad. I mean, I wasn't this extreme of what we see other people doing, but you need to realize you have those seeds in your heart. You've hated people. You've murdered people in your heart. You've held so much revenge and hatred towards towards someone else that you've completely moved them out of your life and removed them completely. You, You have seeds of all of that in your heart. And what does it lead towards? Death. The wages of sin are death. That's what Tom read earlier. Throughout Romans, we're reminded of this. Our own depravity as humanity. And we couldn't do CPR on ourselves. We needed the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit renews. It's it's what he does. Psalm 104 is a great psalm that verse after verse talks about the things that God does. Just these praises for who God is. These praises for what he's done. This is how it starts off. Psalm 104 verse 1. Praise the Lord my soul. Lord my God you are very great. You're clothed with splendor and majesty. And goes verse by verse by verse all the things that God does. And then I want to read verse 30. It says when you send your spirit they are created. Talking about the creatures of the earth. And you renew the face of the ground. Even the face of the ground is affected by the renewal of the creatures that you have made. Not even just creatures, but humanity. Romans chapter 8 talks about this renewal as well. A renewal just when we needed this renewal because we were dead and could not renew ourselves. Starting in verse 10 of Romans chapter 8, it says, But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, right? We're, we're all headed that way. We're all temporary flesh. The Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies because of a Spirit who lives in you. Now, looking at these verses that surround the verses we just read, there's this contrast that Paul is making, this contrast between life in the spirit and life in the flesh. Life in the flesh just leads to death and decay and depravity. It's like that roadkill that Tom talked about. That's that's where we're all headed. That's unfortunately just life. But life in the spirit, that's where it starts in verse 10. There's a contingency. But if Christ is in you, We have this ability, and I understand my metaphor of CPR breaks down at this point, but there's a, there's a ability for when the Holy Spirit is, is reaching out to you to renew you and give you CPR for you to deny it. They say, I don't need CPR. I'm fine myself. Look at my life. I'm, I'm living fine. I got some kids. We're doing this. I got a job. Everything seems fine. 
Or we know we're CPR, we know we're hurt, but we're going, no, 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 I can do it better. I can help myself. You know what, God, you've never showed up for me before. I'm going to figure this out myself. And we completely deny the renewal that the Holy Spirit is trying to bring to us. And so these verses don't apply to us where it says you bring life and bring renewal because we're not in Christ. So what does this look like in our world? I mean, how does the Holy Spirit move from person to person, dude, CPR? What does this look like in Scripture? That's where I want to start. And this is the pattern that I found and a pattern that right right when you think the Holy Spirit follows a pattern, you realize he doesn't. Uh, The pattern does, I mean, the Holy Spirit does what the Holy Spirit does. But this is the emphasis I want to see in the New Testament as we think of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is renewing the world through the church. The Holy Spirit is renewing the world through the church. This seems to be the mode of the the operation of the Holy Spirit and how he works to renew individuals is through the church. In the early church, uh, we see the Holy Spirit coming like the Holy Spirit has not come before on, on the group of disciples. The group of disciples are told to go to Jerusalem and await. And there's been some vague talk in the Old Testament and up to this point about the Spirit. And the disciples will quote that as they preach about Jesus in the coming months and years after Acts chapter 2. But they're they're told to go to Jerusalem to await something. In Acts chapter 2, we see what happens. These, These tongues of fire come down on these individual disciples in the upper room and they start speaking in different languages. And the people start going around. They start, who are these men? What are these men doing? They seem to be drunk. And they're like, it's nine o'clock in the morning. We're not drunk. This is the Holy Spirit. And a sermon is given and they, they realize the power of the Holy Spirit. And throughout Acts, we see the emphasis that the Spirit is making in the church. Acts in chapter 4, Peter goes to jail because he's preaching about Jesus. The next day, he gets out of jail. And so just a day later removed from being in jail. He's before these religious authorities that could put him right back. And it says he didn't, he didn't dig this courage up from within him. He didn't just get over it. What has he done? He, he's empowered by the Holy Spirit to continue preaching Jesus in the face of these religious elites that could put him back in jail. Flip the page to Acts chapter six. We see a man named Stephen chose to serve chose to serve the church because he was filled with the Spirit. And as he's serving the church because he won't be quiet about Jesus, he's put again in front of some religious elite that are getting ready to harm him because, again, they have their system of what they understand God to be and Jesus doesn't quite fit that. And so Stephen gives a beautiful sermon going all the way back to uh, Abraham, all the way up to Jesus. And as he's preaching this sermon, one of the accusations he gives against these people as he calls them stiff-necked is he says, you are resisting the Spirit. And as he says this, the, the religious leader are inflamed and stoned Stephen to death. And right before he dies, it says he was empowered by the Spirit to look up. And he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. You flip the page, Acts chapter 8. Uh, Peter's traveling to some different churches and groups of people that are being baptized. And he notices this group is different. There's a manifestation of the Spirit in these Christians as he's traveling. And he realizes these people in Acts chapter 8 don't have the Spirit. This is how real it is to Peter. Like he can sell, tell those that have the Spirit and those that don't have the Spirit. And he says, well, you're baptized into Jesus. You don't have the Holy Spirit. This doesn't make sense. And so laying on their hands, they receive the Spirit and it makes a difference. To finish off the chapter, we see Philip. Philip preaches to this Ethiopian uh, official and they're on the road traveling and the Ethiopian doesn't understand the scripture. Philip teaches the scripture to them. The Ethiopian says, well, what's keeping me from being baptized? They go into water. He's baptized Scripture says, and Philip was taken away by the Spirit, period. What does that mean? 
Like I have so many questions about the Holy Spirit just taking someone away. Like did Spirit, did Philip just float away? Did they see this happen? Did the Ethiopian turn his back? It says he didn't see him anymore and he wasn't there anymore. And then the next verse just says, oh, and Philip showed up and as a toss and traveled about preaching the gospel. But like, how did he get there? I have so many questions, but this is just what the Spirit does. Because the, the church is expanding at such a great rate, the Spirit is moving in people's lives and renewing person after person after person after community after community. And the world is being renewed by the beginning of the church here in Acts. And so as we go through these, in, you could continue reading in Acts and you see it over and over again. And you might think, well, okay, why don't we see the Spirit like that in church anymore? And now as, as we go through this series, we're going to talk about how the Spirit does work in a lot of different ways. But I, I want to address this question this morning. Why don't we see the Spirit manifestations of this? Or we don't seem to anyways. One is the realization that what we see in the book of Acts, the church is on a knife's edge of survival. I mean, the church has just started and, and the Spirit is protecting the church. And so there's there's these just wild stories of the Spirit showing up in these different ways. There's, there's clear indications. Paul was going to go somewhere and the Spirit says, no, don't go there. And so Paul doesn't go there. We don't get a full explanation. Maybe he would have died and we wouldn't have the message of Scripture and the letters that Paul wrote because of that. And so we don't get the full story, but, but the church is on the edge of survival. And so some of it's just we're, we're living in a different context. And so I don't think we're going to see some of the manifestations of the Spirit in that way because yesterday I wasn't in jail. I, I didn't need the Spirit to open up a jail cell to preach this morning. That happened in Scripture. It happens in other contexts of the world, even today, situations like that where there's persecution of the church. And what do you see in places like that? You tend to see the Spirit move and people go, these miracles are happening all around us. Because it's, it's needed in those contexts because of reasons we just don't understand. Maybe another reason we don't see it in churches today is honestly, we can have a, a pretty arrogant Western understanding of the Spirit. And what I mean by that is because the Spirit and the renewal of the Spirit doesn't fit in my Excel spreadsheet, and I, and I can't quite map how to figure out the Spirit with all these things because the scripture says this, but then I just saw this happen and that just doesn't make sense and I can't test it and I can't put it against the scientific method. I, I just can't accept it. The, the Spirit's a gentleman. He's not going to force himself on you. And so if we deny the Spirit, the Spirit will continue to renew others that need to be renewed when we deny His renewal in our lives. The last thing I thought about, I'm sure there's a lot of others, is that sometimes when we think of the Spirit, and maybe I'm just guilty of that as we read the book of Acts, we, we tend to glorify these big moments of the Spirit, and we underplay the everyday faithfulness and movement of spirit, the Spirit in our lives, right? We, we see some of these and we go, well, I haven't seen the Spirit like that, but that's saying you haven't seen the Spirit. You have seen the Spirit. Uh, was it a coincidence that that person's name came to your mind and you reached out to them and they said, man, I was just having a hard day. Thanks for reaching out. I don't call that a coincidence. Was it a coincidence that you felt like you just need to say that encouraging word to someone and they said, man, I got my test results this week. And you're like, I had no idea you were dealing with that. No, but the Spirit did. And they prodded you to walk towards them, to encourage them. And now you're there and you can pray for them. And you can, you can call the Spirit over to do CPR on this person because they need it. And that's movement of the Spirit. And sometimes we don't think of the Spirit like that, but the Spirit is continually moving and being active in all of those things. So I want to encourage you that, yes, you've seen the Spirit work in great and miraculous ways. But maybe as we go through this spirit, and as we've even sung already this morning, we just be, be more aware of it so we can see the spirit in those moments and we can see him move in our lives and the lives 
of others in everyday ways, not just the big things, though the Spirit does that too. Next point is still about the church and how the Spirit moves in the church. The Holy Spirit is renewing, renewing believers to become disciples who make more disciples. The Holy Spirit is renewing believers to become disciples to make disciples. Now, a disciple is just a follower, a follower that's doing everything they can to look, act, walk, be like the person they are following. For you and I, that is Jesus. We are disciples of Jesus. And as disciples of Jesus, we are not called to just encourage people with moral truths. We're not called to just point out how someone else is doing life poorly. We're not called out to laugh at someone when they're in need of CPR. We are not even encouraged to do CPR. We are encouraged to get the Holy Spirit involved because he's the one that can do CPR. He's the one that is part of the Godhead, God the Father, the only one that can send his son Jesus, and Jesus the only one that could atone for our sins because of his blood and the Holy Spirit that, that prods us to understand all of this. And so we as a disciple are to make other disciples. This is called the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Jesus gives these instructions to his disciples. And I want you to see how he, he continues this in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. His last words to his disciples before, it's after his resurrection, but before he's going to ascend to his father in heaven. In verse 8, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. That's what I mentioned in Acts chapter 2 earlier. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. You're going to be my witness. You're going to witness. You're going to tell others about what the Holy Spirit does. You're going to tell others about their need for CPR. You're going to tell others about their need for the Holy Spirit, not just in Judea, not where we are, but Samaria, elsewhere, not just in Norwin, but Westmoreland County, not just Westmoreland County, but, but the United States, not just the United States, but the world, not just this church, but your family, not just your family, but your neighbors, not just your neighbors, but your community and your coworkers, everybody that you come and influence with, you're going to be my witnesses to the very ends of the earth. I want to wrap up this section. I have one more kind of, it's going to seem like a random thing to say. But I want to finish this section going to Titus chapter 3. And you're going to see, I think, where, where all of this came from in Titus chapter 3, verse 3 through 7, and how... We understand the Spirit's work in our life to become alive. It says, at one time, we too were foolish. He's talking to church people here. We were foolish. We were disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasure. We lived in, lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. That's the baseline of humanity. We're, we're headed towards death in need of CPR. Verse 4. But when the kindness and love of our God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us. And not because our righteousness, not because we got up on ourselves, not because we saved ourselves and did the right thing or said the right thing, but because of His mercy. I see He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. You see that? We're, we were headed to all of these things. Why? Because of our malice, our anger, our hatred. It was all in our hearts. We had hearts of stone that were cold and dead. But through God's grace, not our own righteousness, but his mercy, he sent his son, and his Holy Spirit to purify us, to renew us, to give us rebirth. And he's poured it out generously to the world. So here's my last thought for this morning. I told you we can deny the Holy Spirit. We can deny CPR, even though we know the position where we are. The denial of the Holy Spirit's renewal is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. 
Or maybe there's a scripture you're familiar with. You hear that thought, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. You've heard that before. Maybe you've even been in fear that something you've said or have done is qualified as the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. This phrase occurs three times in scripture, the three, three of the gospels, and then maybe referred to in two other times. And so for this seemingly to be such a big deal, it's really not written about that much. Let's read one of these accounts in Mark chapter 3, verse 28 and 29. It says, truly I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemies, blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They're guilty of eternal life. One way I've heard it said is that if you're, if you're fearful that you've committed the blaspheme of the Holy Spirit, then you haven't, Right? Because you're conscious of the Holy Spirit's work in your life to renew you. But if if someone has continually rejected that renewal, saying, I can do it. The Holy Spirit says I need to be renewed. I don't. That's blaspheme the work of the Holy Spirit. It's a conscious, intentional decision to say no to the Holy Spirit. And so you can see why that would lead to eternal punishment. It's an eternal sin, right? Because you're eternally saying, no, I don't need renewal. But as Christians, this is something we accept, the the, the renewal to say, no, 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 I know where I was. And I know I needed the mercy and grace of Jesus. Look, for some of you, we would love for you to make that decision, maybe for the first time. And you've said those words that I've used before, right? Like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with my life the way it is. Things aren't that bad. I'm not headed to death's door. No, you need a reality check. Sometimes I've, I've heard the phrase um, by well-meaning people saying, I can't believe someone would do that. Maybe you said that yesterday after hearing the news of what happened. And uh, you're like, I, why would, I, I can't believe that. Why would somebody do that? How are we capable of that? Oh, you need to read your Bible. It's been happening for thousands of years. We kill, we hate, we murder, we get revenge. We invent evil plots against others. And you have seeds of that in your heart. You have the beginnings of that already. No one is immune to it. You need to make the decision to accept Jesus Christ and the renewal that the Holy Spirit can bring to your heart and to your soul. That's the, one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit. There's so much to cover. We're going to continue this series throughout the summer. And I'm excited about it because of all the Holy Spirit does. And we're going to have more signs up here. And it's going to probably get a little boxy up here for me with all the, the ministries of the Holy Spirit. And we're so thankful to God for the Holy Spirit and the involvement of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the renewal that we get from the Holy Spirit. If you need prayer about anything, the prayer team will be over there. They'd love to pray for you during the song or after service. There's so many things happening in life and and sometimes you just need to come to someone for prayer because you just can't handle it yourself. They would love to pray for you this morning. Let me pray for all of us as uh, we sing this next song, thinking about where we are with God. Father, we thank you for